The 14th International Conference on Human Functioning presents Creating Health Through Menopause. Your presenter, Dr. Christian Northrup. Okay, we'll start in with the slides right away because um, I want this to be uh, really clinically relevant. And then if there are any of you in the audience who are seeing patients in a primary care setting or a specialty setting and you would be willing to prescribe naturally occurring hormones, uh, if you would please give me your card before you leave because I keep a list of names. I have a newsletter uh, which has a lot of subscribers and uh, it's my way of changing the system from uh, underneath up. Now last night I followed a steel drum uh, band and today following the parasites is like <laughs> the sublime to the, you know, who knows what. Okay, but now we'll go to the National Enquirer. Now, if you want to know what's really going on in the collective unconscious, you just check out at the grocery store and look at the headlines of the National Enquirer. And Larry Dossey taught me that a lot of the uh, medical breakthroughs that you might see five to ten years later actually do first occur in the National Enquirer, which is interesting to me. But anyway, so we... Um, we're looking now here at Cher, okay? So she piles on 25 pounds in an agonizing battle with menopause. You have to understand that the way our culture sees this natural life transition is as a battle. And so, therefore, women in this culture inherit this, and so do men. So the medical profession sees this as a deficiency disease. Now, Rosita Reitz, who has a newsletter called Hot Flash, says, why are the prevailing attitudes about childbirth positive and the ones about menopause negative? What is involved here? Why am I looked on with value when my body is going through one natural function and then 20 years later looked on as valueless when my body is going through another natural function? My life changed much more when I became a mother for the first time than when I started to skip periods. It seems to me that change of life more accurately describes motherhood than menopause. And I would completely agree with that one. Um, I'm going to show you some of the uh, ads, of course, like I did last night. I have more of them because people come to us as physicians uh, with symptoms and a lot of the symptoms around menopause are directly related to the culture we live in. So for instance, in the Kung tribe, there is no word for hot flash. Acculturated Navajo women have menopausal symptoms, traditional Navajo women don't. In, uh, in the Far East, uh, women suffer much less from menopausal symptoms than we do in this culture. What we can say is this, in any culture in which women's status increases after menopause, the number of symptoms is very little. But in this culture, our status does not increase after menopause, right? Because you all know that for uh, every husband who divorces you, there are six 25-year-olds waiting to get him, right? I mean, that's what you see happening, um, except for the wonderful men who come to my lectures who are going to stick around and uh, go through their own change of life with their partner. Now, it's interesting, in uh, menopause, what happens to men in their 40s and 50s is that they begin to move their power center from the third chakra, which is the solar plexus, power over. and According to, um, who's that woman who wrote The Liquid Light of Sex? She's from Sedona or down, out there in Arizona. Anyway, it's very uh, interesting. She talks about that men in general get their erections from their second and third chakra power, but in later life, their erections and sexual potency comes from their heart and moves up. And so the uh, quality of orgasm changes for men uh, in later life, but they go through a transition period in late 40s when there's a while, they might go through some periods of impotence as this energy shift is taking place. And so, um, according to her, and I would agree with this, many affairs take place not because he's really interested in leaving this primary relationship, but because he also is terrified by this inability to have a full sexual life, which is very important. So that's interesting to me. This is the high heart, and this is the low heart. Okay. So this is what we hear. This is the Premarin Company. You think it's good medicine. She thinks it's wonderful. What is the subtext of this picture? She's a complete fool, and she'll just do whatever we tell her to do. I mean, really. 
Um, I don't know about you, but I got one of these plastic bones from the Permarin Company. They must have sent out a gazillion of them. And they disarticulate down at the hip so that every one of you can make the correlation between a hip fracture and uh, taking estrogen. Actually, the only uh, FDA approval for estrogen replacement is prevention of osteoporosis. Did you know that? That's the only FDA approved use for hormone replacement for Premarin. Okay, this is one of my favorite. I feel more like a woman again. Like, what was she before? <laughs> it's unbelievable. This is Ester Test. My husband says, and it's estrogen, it's synthetic estrogen and synthetic testosterone. So it's to increase a woman's libido. It completely wipes out any beneficial effect that the estrogen might have on her lipid profile. Um, so my husband says they should just call it what it is, extra sex. You know? <laughs> okay, and this, is, and this is those scare tactics, calcium every day, aerobics every week, bone loss every year. You know, like there's nothing you can do, even though we have very well-documented studies now that show that women who do weight training can increase bone mass at any time in their lives. How to keep menopause in check. What is, this, what is the subtext that menopause, again, is a, an abnormal process and we've got to control it. And frankly, I believe that PMS and menopausal symptoms and all of that are from over control of everything, really. It's trying to keep everything in check. Then this is one of my fun ones, you know, astroglide, second only to nature. It's like coming in for a landing here. Look at the graphic. <laughs> no. Now, I'm not, uh, I don't doubt that a lot of women uh, get vaginal dryness. They do, but not all of them do. And, uh, you know, these products get to be fun. And then, of course, last night you saw this fate of the untreated menopause, and you see that she's looking out at the dry, cracked earth. Uh, you know, so we always show my mother who's the fate of the untreated menopause, and she's fine. And on um, her medical intuitive readings, I don't know if you, have you ever had medical intuitives come and talk at these lectures? No. Uh, He's into the, uh, you know, concrete, measurable, physical reality, but in another reality. Um, my mother had a reading done by Carolyn Mace, who is a, a world-famous medical intuitive, and uh, without seeing her, just knowing her name and age, she said her body registers uh, the same as a 35-year-old. Only she's 69. So what you need to understand is uh, chronologic age and biologic age are often completely different. We all know 40-year-olds who are very old and 80-year-olds who are very young. So, you know, the, the plan is to die uh, young as old as possible. <laughs> all right, now, our bodies have the ability throughout the life cycle to produce all the hormones we need because starting with cholesterol, we can take cholesterol and then make it into DHEA, androstenedione, dione, testosterone, estro, estrone, estradiol all natural hormones. So our bodies have the capacity to do this. Whether or not they do it depends a lot on your circumstances, your nutrition, because every one of those biological conversions is dependent on minerals and the right enzymes and so on. And these are the hormone producing sites in the body, pineal gland, hair follicle, breast, liver, adrenal gland, ovary, body fat. The ovaries produce hormones throughout your life cycle. They always produce estradiol, testosterone, and progesterone. So there is a, a myth in the gynecologic literature about the postmenopausal quiescent ovary. They are never completely quiescent ever. In fact, in the perimenopausal period, the uh, outer surface of the ovary, known as the theca, actually shrinks a bit, but the inner stroma hypertrophies. And so more androgens are produced after menopause than they were before. And that's very interesting to me. There, I, I did hear about a tribe in the Amazon rainforest. I have not been able to find an anthropologist to confirm this, but a tribe that had a belief that women died once they stopped having their periods. And so in this tribe, the women were recorded as having their periods into their 80s. All right. And then, of course, I told you last night about the Huichol Indians who routinely have children into their 50s and sometimes into their 60s as well. See, the deal with them is they are outside of the mainstream. They're 15,000 miles from the nearest television station. So they don't know that menopause is a Premarin deficiency. 
See, and if they haven't learned that yet, see, then their biology follows, uh, follows that. Now, you probably have all heard Deepak Chopra by now talk about the, uh, the Tarahumara Indians who uh, had a tradition of running 100 miles a day. That's just what they always did, the men anyway. They sent a team down from Harvard to only, they had a belief system that the best runners were in their 60s. So they sent a team down from Harvard to study them and they did uh, respiratory rate and uh, vital capacity, blood pressure, cardiac output and so on. So the 20 year old runners were pretty good. The 30 year olds had even better vital capacity and so on. But the peak guys for running and every other parameter of physical fitness were the people in their 60s because this was the belief that the entire tribe had. At this time in history, our entire tribe has the belief that after the age of 30, we start to disintegrate. And after you have lost your menstrual period, it's really all over. Okay, so we, are all, we all have that programming in our electromagnetic fields. So one of my reasons for teaching this material is that I know for every one of you who wakes up to the fact that we are meant to mature but not deteriorate, my chances are better of being able to do it because we have to do this together at the level at which we're all connected. It has to happen together. Now this is sort of how synthetic hormone replacement became part of uh, the collective unconscious. So the guy up the top is saying, no way, no way, it's not true. And then down here, nope, nope, no way, it's not true. And then some big honcho over there, right, goes, it is so. And they've got a lot of money and a lot of air time. I, um, I now know what's coming because I get uh, drug ads. The latest I got was PremPro, so they finally combined Premarin and Provera, both synthetic hormones not even known in the female body human body, uh, they've combined those together and then they send me a letter that says, you should know about this because we're about to do a campaign blitz in McCall's, Ladies Home Journal, uh, all of that, and then we're going to do a TV blitz. So now the tail is big time wagging the dog because then they come to you. It's the same as that PSA thing that we heard about earlier with the prostate. So this big guy over there now tells all of us what to do until we become more media literate. So then everyone down here says, yep, it's right. They're right, absolutely it's right. You know, so now they're gonna make Premarin generic. They're gonna to try to make it generic, but the Premarin people don't want it to be generic. So what they're telling you is, there are four or five horse hormones in there, because it's from pregnant mare's urine, you know this, okay? There are four or five horse hormones in there that we don't really know what they are, so we can't be sure women are gonna get the real stuff. The real stuff, folks, is estradiol, estrone, and estriol, progesterone, DHEA, that my own ovaries make now, and that the human fetus has been marinated in since in utero. Those are the ones I would like in my body if I do this. Okay. Now, the reason I think that we are all uh, want to do this Premarin thing or what's best is, is just what Helen Keller says, because we want to avoid danger. We want to avoid anything that might hurt. How do I know these natural hormones you're suggesting will do the same as Premarin? Well, the only people who've got the huge studies are those companies, right? because of the history of the whole thing. So, but Helen Keller writes, avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And if Helen Keller, who was deaf, dumb, and blind, felt that, I mean, the rest of us could probably try a natural remedy here. Let's talk about this, women and heart disease, the silent epidemic. And the one major selling point for the conjugated estrogens is the fact that it raises your HDL cholesterol and lowers the LDL cholesterol. The triglycerides go up, of course. Okay, so this is the number, and then extrapolating this um, to a population, just taking this epidemiologic data is to lead us to believe that because heart disease is the number one killer of women, then everyone should be on this just because this might decrease your risk of heart disease. But this is a profile of a low-risk woman, and in my opinion, and all the studies I've read, and I'll show you a meta-analysis, I think 
hormone replacement therapy in this culture at this time is optional for this group of women. Normal physiologic menopause at, the age, 50, at, at age 50 plus or minus five years. All right, we're seeing many more women now going through premature menopause, so I'm not talking about this group. Um, no family history of cardiovascular disease before the age of 65. No family history of osteoporosis. Medium to heavy frame, non-smoker, no long-term use of drugs associated with the increased risk of osteoporosis, which is um, uh, prednisone, that sort of thing. Regular weight-bearing and aerobic exercise three times per week. A nutrient-rich diet relatively low in fat and adequate in protein, but not too much protein. Minimal alcohol consumption. I made that up, no more than two, one or two drinks per week because I don't know what minimal alcohol consumption is. I do know that two drinks every night wipes out your REM sleep. And REM sleep and dreaming, REM sleep is of course associated with dreaming, and dreams are a major source of guidance for us, so why would we want to be wiping them out, really? And I think if you have to have your two drinks a night, you better check out your relationship with alcohol. All right, and then a passion for living. The heart is electrified by a passion for living. Do you know the studies out at the Institute of Heart Math in Boulder Creek, uh, California? The heart has 60 times the electrical activity of the brain. When you're thinking with your heart, it is the heart that entrains all the rest of the organs in the body. You have to have a passion for living, or I don't care how much hormones you're on, it's not gonna work. Um, I would consider hormone replacement in this group. Premature menopause, earlier than the age of 40. Artificial menopause before the age of 45, induced by surgery, drugs, chemotherapy, or radiation. Currently, artificial menopause is one in four women in this culture, so this is a lot of women. You know how it starts, right? You teach all the women to hate their pelvic organs as soon as you possibly can, and then you can make money off it. You know, so that's how we do it. All right, uh, diagnosed cardiovascular disease, very strong family history of early cardiovascular disease. Uh, high umbilical to hip ratio. Now, we know that women who gain a lot of weight in the upper body are at an increased risk. You know, it's the apple-shaped figure versus the pear-shaped figure. Um, fat thighs will never hurt your health. Never will. Thin thighs, we don't know. But, um, but upper body weight, where you have a lot of fat around the, the trunk area, is definitely an increased health risk, because we know that's associated with hyperinsulinemia and so on, and uh, hirsutism, polycystic ovary disease, adult onset diabetes, all of that stuff. Um, a smoker, sedentary, sedentary nutrient-poor refined food diet, and a perception that there's nothing to live for. Um, I wanted to point out that if we lived in another culture, having a few little terminal hairs on your chin and on your upper lip would not be a problem. This is a famous uh, Mexican artist, and that's her self-portrait. I can't remember her name. Um, so you see that she has a mustache. That is perfectly fine down there. It is not fine here. Uh, about 70 to 90 percent of women around menopause or sooner in this culture will develop some terminal hairs on their chin and on their upper lip. This is because the androgenic uh, portion of our ovaries kicks in. Remember last night I talked about ovaries are female balls? It's fascinating to me that in most marriages, if you, uh, if you stay together long enough, the men will become more focused in midlife on the home, gardening, uh, matters of the heart the women are more interested in going out into the world. It's like there's an interesting role reversal. And I think some of this is uh, the way nature set it up is you've got a lot of wisdom, so it's time to get out there and raise some hell, I think. Um, but also, you're going to have a few extra little hairs here. Don't worry about it. You'd use electrology. You can use waxing. It's just not acceptable in this culture. But you don't need selective ovarian vein catheterization okay, to see if you've got to, I mean, you remember those lectures, the endocrinologist would come in and tell you, you know, that this is an aberration, we all got to go out and get our ovarian veins catheterized to make sure we don't have androgenic tumors. You, the women with the adrenoblastomas, with the big tumors, you know when they walk in, okay, you know, they have beards, they have balding, you know, you know who they are. Okay, osteoporosis, um, 
there is no need to get this, and it can be prevented. I'm a little concerned that in a Barbie doll culture, our young women who don't have enough body fat to menstruate certainly are not getting peak bone mass, which we have to get by the age of 20. Okay. Now, you can always increase your bone mass. Keep that in mind. But it's really nice to start with a high bone mass because statistically, women lose 15% of their bone mass in the first five years after menopause. But if you start high, that will not put you in the fracture range. Okay. And that's important to know. These are the factors predisposing women to postmenopausal osteoporosis, uh, low estrogen progesterone levels throughout their life. The worst risks for this, interestingly enough, are the marathon runners, the female athletes who are amenorrheic. And interestingly enough, putting them on birth control pills and synthetic hormones does not restore their bone mass. I think because it is not the running that causes the amenorrhea. Did you know this? It's not the exercise. It is the fact that they are anorexic and they are using running as a form of binging, of purging. All right. So running, laxatives, vomiting are all a part of the whole bulimorexia, eating disorder spectrum. All right. If women, if women uh, took in enough calories, to make up for the exercise expenditure, they would not become amenorrheic from the running. And those studies have been done. So I was a little concerned when I first started to see them because I thought, oh, great. Now we're going to have another reason why women shouldn't use their bodies in a powerful way. But it's not that. It's the fact that if the woman's using it to remain thin, using exercise to remain thin, then she's in danger of the severe osteoporosis where a woman who's 25 can have the bones of an 80-year-old on dual x-ray bone densitometry. Okay. Uh, dietary insufficiencies, of course, malabsorption of calcium, uh, race, oriental and white, physical inactivity, cigarette smoking, alcoholism, and uh, aging. Body frame size. If you want to know your body frame size, I'll give you a quick way to do it. You take your thumb, and this is for women. I don't know what it is for men. You take your thumb and your third finger, and you put it around your wrist. All right, like this, uh, right around where the two wrist bones come in. If your fingers do not touch, notice mine don't, you have a large frame and much less risk for osteoporosis. If they just touch, you have a medium frame. If they overlap, you can be one of those models, but you're going to have to worry about your bones a little later. Okay. All right, so that's how you tell what your frame size is. Now, aren't you glad? Because now you can go back to those metropolitan life insurance tables where it tells you about what your weight should be. In, you know, and you have to do your height in two-inch heels. This is stupid, but you've all seen those. OK, anyway, that's body frame size. This is a, a readout from a dual x-ray bone densitometry. This is currently the gold standard. This test is as predictable uh, of osteoporosis as a cholesterol reading is for subsequent heart disease, which means there's some skip areas, but it's the best we've got. All right. I, in any woman who has a history of amenorrhea, no periods or premature menopause and so on, I'm apt to get one of these tests. Insurance usually does not cover it unless you already have bona fide osteoporosis. Because as you know, that is how our insurance system works. It's not really insurance. You got to be sick to have it kick in. The, co the cost of the test is about $120, $130, but at least gives us a baseline. Now, this is a woman who was uh, 54, still having periods. Now, you'll notice that built into this graph, I don't know if we have that pointer still around here. What did I do? Put it in my pocket? No. Anyway, built into this graph is good. That sort of five-year uh, average. You see this? This is where the bones, where you lose uh, that bone mass. But I want you to know that I see women all the time, because none of you are means in a population. I see women all the time who are way up here, who have the bone density of a 20-year-old, women who are in their 50s, 60s. So again, you don't want to get hexed by the media on this. Your, your bones may be perfectly good and solid. Um, so mineral reserve, increased bone density gives you a lower biologic bone age. And 
as the uh, researchers at Tufts that reported in the New England Journal just reported, you can build bone mass uh, anywhere in your 50s into your 70s without hormone replacement just by uh, weight-bearing exercise, and they used heavy weights. So they uh, had women work at 80% of their capacity in 40-minute workouts twice per week. Luckily, the women who did the study at Tufts in the Human Nutrition Center are coming out with a book that will be called Tentatively Strong Women Stay Young, and so we'll all have the uh, ability to get on that program. In the meantime, I would uh, keep some um, work up, but I'd keep some 10 to 20 pound weights around. I keep mine in front of the TV. Then when I go by, I just uh, lift weights, you know, and we just trip over the weights all the time, but then I use them. That's my exercise program is a Nordic track in front of the television. You've got to have this stuff where you'll do it, and weights all over the place so that as I'm dying of the microwave radiation coming out of the uh, television, I at least will have strong bone. Okay. So we talked already about this. This is just aerobics in hell. Three more, two more, one more, five million leg lifts. Okay, don't over-exercise. It's used by women as a form of anorexia. Doesn't work out very well. Oh, this is just one of my patients who did a, a wonderful uh, meditation using imagery on her own bone density. She was worried that she had low bone density. She's an artist. So she did her vertebral column like uh, Monet's bridge here. And then she began to do a whole meditation on her vertebral column. And what came up, I know you can't see it very well, was a snake. I don't know that she knew about Kundalini, but she began to envision her vertebral column as a snake. And I thought that was very interesting. The Kundalini energy, the life force, begins to rise spontaneously in your 40s. And so it goes and uh, hits on the different chakras where you need a little tune-up. And that's why a lot of women get palpitations at menopause. They get heart palpitations. The herb motherwort is very nice for that. But I've seen women go in literally believing they were having a heart attack or heart disease when all it was was the kundalini energy rising and some palpitations, panic attacks, as they were remembering childhood issues that now needed to be resolved as they went into menopause. Okay, these are the calcium, magnesium, vitamin D daily requirements for women. And so age 50, uh, 35 to 50, about 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day, 750 of magnesium, 250 of vitamin D. And postmenopausal, uh, you need uh, 1,200 milligrams, of, 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, 1,000 of magnesium, 400 of vitamin D. Now, in the third world where the diet is not so high in protein, 400 milligrams of calcium a day will keep your bones strong if you're exercising and you're out in the fields and you're in the sun a lot. But in this culture, the diet is more, has more protein. Adequate vitamin D can be obtained from regular exposure to sunlight, 20 to 30 minutes per day on the face or arms, March through October in the northern latitudes. So osteoporosis in the Inuit culture is very common now that sugar, and, uh, sugar has been added to the diet. But I think even before that, when the diet is completely fat and protein, it increases the rate at which calcium is excreted in the urine. So that's another reason to not eat excessive amounts of protein. Now, onset of postmenopausal symptoms. First of all, you need to realize that most women, many women, do not get these. In this culture, 90% of women do get hot flashes. Okay. Um, however, I, there's an interesting thought I have on those. If hyperthermia kills some cancer cells, which it undoubtedly does, maybe that's nature's way of getting us tuned up for the next 30 to 40 years and we shouldn't be suppressing hot flashes. I always recommend hormone replacement when hot flashes are resulting in sleep disorders. When a woman is not sleeping, not getting enough REM sleep, and then she will need uh, some hormone replacement usually to get her back to sleep. Because if she is not doing that, she'll become depressed, and then it's a vicious cycle. And it doesn't do any good to withhold. So. Um, Hot flashes can occur long before you have your last menstrual period. The last menstrual period is, on average, in this culture, age 52. Many women come to see me having symptoms starting in their 40s, and they're still having periods. I start treatment then. Very low doses of the naturally occurring hormones. And in the handout that I've included, I've included a lot on how you do this, what you prescribe, and so on. Uh, the formulary pharmacies is where you can get natural hormones. 
Um, the major drug companies, of course, are not uh, using them because they're not patentable. All right. You, you need to understand this. That, well, I'll get into this a bit later. Um, but anyway, uh, many, many women don't have vaginal discomfort, don't have bladder symptoms, don't have heart disease, don't have osteoporosis. If you do have bladder symptoms, however, that's because the outer one-third of the urethra is estrogen sensitive. And in women who have a thinning of the outer one-third of the urethra perimenopausally, all they need is a dab of estriol once a day on that area. They can put it on with their finger and the urinary symptoms, this repeated urinary tract infection thing just goes away. And you should all know about that because it's so helpful and it's so simple to do. Okay. Now, so we have the mind-body uh, connection in menopause. Let me point out this is lifetime probabilities of selected conditions for a 50-year-old white woman at risk for coronary heart disease treated with long-term hormone replacement. So coronary heart disease with no treatment, a uh, percentage of women who will get this in their lifetime is 71.2. If they're on estrogen and progesterone, 64.4. Percentage of stroke is 15.4. If they're on estrogen and progesterone, 15.6. Hip fracture, no treatment, 11.3%. With estrogen and progesterone, 9.2%. Breast cancer, 9.1%. With hormone replacement, using synthetic hormones, okay, 17.9. Although Lila Noctigal has a 25-year prospective trial that has gone on in New York City showing no correlation between hormone replacement and breast cancer. Uh, Isaac Schiff, who's chief of gynecology at Mass General, was just at our center giving a lecture, and he said, if you have a study showing that there is no correlation between hormone replacement and breast cancer, you cannot get it published. Okay, so right now, the journals want this data. So it's like it keeps everyone stirred up, and then we're more controllable. So if you're always out of touch with that calm center within, then we can control you. All right. Uh, endometrial cancer, 2.4%, 2.4%. So life expectancy without hormone replacement for a 50-year-old woman at risk for coronary artery disease, her life expectancy is 79.6 years. With hormone replacement, her life expectancy is 80.2 years. Kind of puts it into perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. But what you're looking at is quality of life, and sometimes a diet, that's a little main word we use, of natural hormones can do a lot of good, but they must be prescribed individually. This is estradiol. This is the naturally occurring hormone. This is ethanyl estradiol, one of the synthetic hormones. You see how they've added the different groups here? You know how specific receptor sites are in your cells for specific hormones. When you add these groups, the, the hormone companies take uh, native estradiol, native progesterone, they get their uh, natural hormones from the same place as the natural companies, from wild Mexican yams or soybeans. They take the natural stuff and then they add these other chemical groups to it to make it synthetic and patentable so you can make a profit. Okay, and that's why it's not available in most of the uh, regular drugstores. This is progesterone, this is natural progesterone, this is Provera, medroxyprogesterone acetate. Since it's just called progesterone in the medical literature, most people do not know the difference, and most doctors, between natural, native progesterone and uh, Provera. Provera has a lot of side effects in the body, bloating, headaches. So this is the part of their hormone replacement regimen that women hate the most, which is the Provera part. They might feel okay on the Premarin, but when they get on the Provera, they feel lousy. You can uh, take care of all of that by just getting rid of the Provera and adding uh, natural progesterone, 100 milligrams a day. My favorite regimen for hormone replacement is estradiol, 0.5 milligrams, which is half the usual dose of Premarin all right, biologically, mixed with 100 milligrams of natural progesterone. And I have that in your handout, and it uh, was developed by Dr. Joel Hargrove, who is one of the pioneers in natural hormone replacement. He has written extensively about this, and he has a, a how-to article coming out in Medical Clinics of North America this fall, W.B. Saunders. It's a real cookbook, exactly how to do this. Now, in the PEPI study, this is the postmenopausal estrogen study that was published in JAMA last year, what they found is the women who were on the natural progesterone 
had the best lipid profiles of everybody because the Provera, the synthetic stuff, actually wipes out some of the beneficial effects of estrogen on the lipid profile. In the Women's Health Initiative, which is costing us taxpayers something like, well, it's billions of dollars, the government is now sponsoring the definitive study on whether hormone replacement is what we want or not. They are using no natural hormones, none. So if you're one of those doctors who's willing to prescribe these, um, I have an internist friend at the University of Wisconsin who's done a great deal of research, and what we're going to try to do is a parallel study using the natural hormones so that at the end of this, five to 10 years, we'll have some parallel data. This is the mechanism of action for steroid hormones. So you can see a hormone like estradiol comes in and it must combine with the nuclear estrogen receptors in the cell to act as a growth hormone. Estradiol does this in the cell, so it is the most native of the estrogens. So estradiol in small doses is the one that gets rid of the symptoms the easiest and the fastest. Okay, so you can use small amounts of it, but it does act as a growth hormone, and that's why women get sore breasts and endometrial hyperplasia when they're on too much. In the nurse's health study that just came out showing that these nurses had an increased risk of breast cancer, on 0.625 milligrams of Premarin, which is the most common dosage, you can have a 20-fold difference between women in blood levels, 20-fold. So we don't know from that study, since it was a questionnaire study, we don't know if the women who got the breast cancer were being grossly overstimulated, you see. Dr. Hargrove tests the estradiol levels in every one of his patients to see what their levels are. And just for your own, um, your own lab, uh, a therapeutic range for serum estradiol at a fasting level. So if you take your last dose at, at uh, midnight and get your, well, at six at night or something, and you get your uh, blood drawn 12 hours later, the estradiol level to be in a therapeutic range is 50 to 150 picograms per ml. So that's how you can test it. If a woman comes in with PMS symptoms, headaches, see, estrogen can act as a cortico, um, uh, as a, a, like epinephrine. It can have those effects and cause a bitemporal headache. So women who are having that from estrogen are on way too much. And so you want to cut their dose down. If you add progesterone, you can use much less natural estrogen because the progesterone has the ability to be converted into the right stuff in your body. Okay, these are the conventional forms of estrogen replacement, Premarin, Provera, Estrace, and Provera, Ortho, Est, and Amen, et cetera. They essentially eliminate increased risk of endometrial cancer from unopposed estrogen. What do we have, about two minutes left here? Just tell me so I can whip through this. Five. Five, okay. So you all know this. It prevents, reverses vaginal and urinary symptoms from vaginal and urethral thinning, associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke, reduced risk of osteoporotic fracture, multiple forms to meet individual needs and choices. In Los Angeles, they studied uh, a bunch of conventional OBGYNs, conventional and they found 41 different ways in which to prescribe just the synthetic hormones. So you can imagine when you get into the natural stuff. Okay, conventional HRT. Readily available in conventional pharmacies, majority of US clinical studies have been done using this type of HRT. Are we surprised? You know, because who else is gonna do it? Relatively easy to find a healthcare provider who has expertise in using the conventional HRT. Why? Because the detail men come around and tell us how to do it. And you use whatever you got on your shelf. Okay, uh, drawbacks. Breast cancer risk is unknown, may be increased, may not be increased. Uh, Isaac Schiff believes that after seven years, there is a, a slightly increased risk, after seven years of being on conventional hormone replacement. Synthetic progestins negate some of the cardiovascular benefits of estrogen. Combination ERT protects against bone loss only while the patient is taking it, since most fractures occur when a woman is in her 80s, best protection is obtained from lifelong use. Significant progestin side effects result in decreased use. So about 30% of women who get a prescription actually take it, which I kind of like, because one of my least favorite words in the medical lexicon is compliance, like we're all fools. I don't like that word. 
Okay, drawbacks, many women don't like having monthly bleeding. If you use estradiol combined with natural progesterone, you don't bleed. Most women, after they hit age 52, would prefer not to bleed. Okay, some would like to, so you can work it that way, all right? Uh, ongoing screening required, finding the optimal combination requires an ongoing partnership, of course. Okay, these are the natural estrogens, estradiol, estrone, estriol, and progesterone combinations derived from plant sources, soybeans, or yams. They provide endometrial protection without any negative effects on cholesterol levels, excellent patient acceptance because of freedom from side effects. Estrogen, progesterone taken in combination eliminate monthly bleeding, effectively relieves hot flashes, and may improve mood, libido, physical energy. Same goes for the conventional stuff. It may do that. Uh, may relieve joint aches and pains associated with menopause in Chinese medicine. The joint aches and pains that come at menopause are from deficient yin. In Chinese medicine, there are about 20 different uh, uh, ways, 20 different diagnoses for hot flashes. So Chinese medicine and acupuncture is a wonderful way to go through uh, menopause if you've got a good practitioner nearby who knows how to do this. Uh, effectively relieves vaginal dryness, urinary symptoms. Hormones are identical to those naturally occurring in the female body. You can use them orally or transdermally. By the way, Estroderm patch and the new, um, what is that called? It's a new one. Another patch that's a seven-day patch by 3M, Chimera. That's estradiol. That's native estradiol. They got around that one by patenting the glue on the patch. Okay? So... Um, studies of conjugated estrogens and natural progesterones show better lipid profile as we went over. Disadvantages, prescribing requires a pharmacist and a physician willing to work in partnership with the patient to find optimal doses. Now we got about 2,000 years of history between apothecaries and physicians working together to find the individual optimal dose. But when the drug companies took over, I think it was with the Flexner Report and uh, FD, uh, John D. Rockefeller and all that, and the pharmaceutical industry took over medicine, then the pharmaceutical industry started to tell pharmacists what sizes the pills came in. So they simply became pill dispensers. A couple of the uh, pharmacists in my area just defected and started a formulary pharmacy, and they talked with me about how fulfilling it is to actually be a pharmacist again and to work with the physicians to find the right dosage for the individual patient. Um, cost sometimes is not covered by insurance plans. However, doctors, patients w uh, will hear from their HMOs that this stuff is not FDA approved. That is not true. Doctors have been prescribing natural hormones for years and years. And doctors, by law, have the right to prescribe anything in the U.S. pharmacopoeia. All right, so the FDA has nothing to do with it. All right, natural hormones are generic, and we talked about that. Um, vaginal estrogen use, very low doses of vaginal estrogen use if a woman only has a complaint of vaginal dryness, then all she needs to do is take vaginal estrogen. And if you use estriol, it has virtually no absorption into the bloodstream because it does not combine with the nuclear estrogen receptors in the cell. It is unbelievably adherent locally, and it only affects the cytoplasm of the cell. So estriol can be used as a vaginal cream, 0.5 milligrams, three to five days per week on the average, will give you an excellent local effect with no systemic absorption. And even if it were absorbed systemically, it appears to act just like tamoxifen, but without any of the side effects. Estriol is a much understudied estrogen, which uh, we have some preliminary data that shows that in women with metastatic breast cancer, Given estriol, 30% had regression of their metastatic tumors because I believe the estriol combines with some of the estrogen receptors on the cell but does not act as a growth hormone. So in women with a family history of breast cancer or who've had breast cancer or ovarian cancer, I use on average two milligrams of estriol combined with natural progesterone as an ERT regimen. A lot of your women who've had breast cancer and chemotherapy will be suffering greatly from menopausal symptoms, and there's no need for it. You can use estriol, and it works very, very well. But even regular old Premarin cream, if you use it, uh, just a third of an applicator three nights a week, also does not cause endometrial hyperplasia. All right? This is biologically occurring estrone, estradiol, and estriol. 
Now, what you'll notice is estrone can become estradiol. But once you go to estriol, it does not go backward. It does not. So once you're at estriol, then you're safe. There's some studies that show that women with the highest urinary excretion of estriol appear to have the lowest rates of breast cancer. Much more study needs to be done. My rationale for estriol in HRT regimens is uh, that uh, the decreased risk of breast cancer. One study demonstrated promising reversal of metastatic breast cancer. Estriol is the only estrogen that is not converted back to estrone or estradiol. Estriol is a weak estrogen relative to estrone and estradiol. It doesn't combine with the nuclear estrogen receptors to promote cell growth. It may function like tamoxifen, can be safely given to women with estrogen-dependent tumor, and uh, it has a long and safe history in Europe. Here are the drawbacks. Very high doses are required to gain the same effect as other estrogens on bone density, up to 12 milligrams a day, which would cause too much nausea. So if you're on this, you're not going to get the same effect as your bones. It's not always as effective as other estrogens in relieving hot flashes. Cardiovascular benefits may not be comparable to conventional ERT. So what Jonathan Wright came up with was to give regimens in which estriol is combined with very small amounts of estrone and or estradiol, usual dose, 0.625 milligrams of total estrogens made up of 80% estriol, 10% estradiol, 10% estrone, and this is known as triestrogen. So the formulary pharmacies already know how to make this up. Get a nice relationship going with your pharmacist. Plant estrogen and progesterone combinations, phytoestrogens, you've probably heard of these, Ostoderm, Progenol, Sgen, Progest, Progestone. These are synthesized from plant sources, and uh, they can give you relief of hot flashes, and one study showed increased bone mass with consistent use of Progest. Um, but these are not exactly the same as naturally occurring hormones in your body. Uh, this is just to point out that precursors from yam uh, can go to pregnenolone and then become all these other chemicals in your body. So a lot of women are getting over-the-counter yam creams and using them. If they work, great. Um, we won't go through all the advantages and disadvantages. It's a, it's a lot. These are some of the herbs that have been used for centuries. Angelica, Don Quai, chasteberry, black quahosh, licorice root, fennel, peony, uh, Romania, Discaria, soybeans. Thousands of years of safe and effective use in all cultures worldwide. I don't see any way we're going to get controlled clinical trials because the doses are so individual. They may act as adaptogens, blocking hormonal receptor sites and preventing overstimulation if estrogen or other hormone levels are too high or if hormone levels are too low, acting like the hormone itself. So if you've heard this concept, adaptogen, Plant estrogens appear to sit on the estrogen receptor sites in your breast, in your uterus, and act like estrogens, but they prevent the overstimulation of those same organs if you have too high a circulating level of estrogen, which is one of the reasons why we believe oriental women have so low a risk of breast cancer because their intake of soybeans is so high. And there has been a study in the uh, Journal of Clinical Nutrition that showed that women who take 50 grams of soy protein a day have the same uh, profile of estrogens in their blood as those women on tamoxifen. So again, wouldn't it be interesting to study just eating 50 grams of tofu a day instead of taking the tamoxifen, which causes severe depression in uh, some women, not all. Okay, Plant preparations do this, and we don't have words for this in conventional medicine, nourish and tonify to help retain overall balance and well-being. These concepts are foreign to conventional allopathic medicine theory. Okay, And these are very effective, but there's enormous variation of action, form, taste, smell, potency, allowing for maximal flexibility and individual dosing, but also maximal confusion if you want the one magic bullet that will take care of it for you. Okay. Let's just talk for a minute about the things that also happen to menopausal women, which I think are part of the problem. Okay, so you look at this guy, right? And it just says, kids are like boomerangs. The farther you throw them, the harder they hit the house when they return. Okay, so we have now uh, a huge percentage of women in the menopausal years. Yes, they're in the ideal world your ovaries would begin to change their function. Remember, they're never shutting down completely. Your adrenal glands, your body fat, your pineal gland, your liver would take over that function if you were fully nourished. 
and living your life well and moving into your wisdom years. If you're taking care of aging in-laws, if you're the oldest daughter who's expected to take care of everybody. Now here's my solution for that. Right now, before this ever becomes a problem, you sit down with your siblings, especially if they're brothers, okay? And you say, look, if mom needs care, this is, and you want me to do it, this is what it's gonna cost you. So you make that kind of arrangement. I've had uh, patients do that because it's usually, it really, it's the daughter who's at home, you know, who stayed in Wichita, everyone else is in San Francisco, and she ends up doing it, but the others want to come home at Christmas and have everything the way it always was. Yeah, yeah, don't do that. I mean, it's like a risk for breast cancer. Don't do it. Uh, you get everyone together, and, uh, and this is another thing that comes up at menopause, which has sometimes been called a pause from men. Okay, honey, honey, life is so short, why not, uh, you know, why not spend it, why, let's not spend it quibbling about who does the housework. A lot of stuff comes up at menopause, and if you haven't taken care of it premenstrually, it'll hit you between the eyeballs. And I believe the women with the worst menopausal symptoms are the ones who've been sitting on stuff that they haven't been dealing with. The kundalini's rising, it's hitting the data banks in their chakras saying, you gotta change this stuff or you can't enter your wisdom years in an intact enough manner to go out and change the world, which is your role. So we have menopausal outbursts. This is uh, Mount St. Helens. See, no, so I don't think this stuff is necessarily hormonal, but it all comes at that interesting time. Now, there's another anthropologic view of menopause, and that is that for the first time in written human history anyway, women are living beyond the age of menopause. So it's a big experiment. So I think using a little bit of natural hormones and a little bit of help makes perfect sense unless you're a Huichol Indian, in which case you don't need it, okay? So that's okay with me. And maybe evolution just has to catch up because it doesn't make sense that we would lose our hormonal support when we have 40 more years to go. And a lot of women remember don't. So stress results in poor adrenal function and inability to make that transition from the ovaries over to the adrenal glands, which should be happening. Um, and remember we talked last night about the fact that your FSH, LH levels, even on hormone replacement, stay up for the rest of your life. These are neurotransmitters. I believe they change the way the brain functions so that you are now, uh, you have available to you a different brain style where you have access to your wisdom in a different way than you did before. But you have to do this descent in the mythology, descent to Inanna, myth of going into the underworld. In, I, in those women I have in my practice who are willing to do the whole initiation of menopause, they may have two or three years of fuzzy thinking where they can't balance their checkbook. I believe that's a shift in brain function. It is not the beginning of Alzheimer's. It is not. Unless you would like to check out of your life and have someone else take care of your body which you might want to do. But it, it is not the beginning of Alzheimer's. Women are terrified that it is. If you have a big family history of Alzheimer's, there is some data that a little estradiol will help your neurons. So I wouldn't uh, hesitate. This is an example of some of the creativity I see in my practice uh, that comes after menopause. This is a woman who does quilting, and this is a quilt with every letter in the alphabet in it. This is an A, and it's hanging in an elementary school. I see enormously wonderful things coming from this age group. As affirmed by the research results, this is Jean Octoberg and Frank Lawless, the course of cancer and probably other disease groups as well can be better predicted by psychological variables than medical measures. So women do not become heaps of hormonal woes at menopause unless they're set up. And uh, William Allen White wrote, my advice to women of America is to raise more hell and fewer dahlias. <laughs> I agree with that. And we've talked about giving birth to yourself, all right. This is one of my patients who did just that. She had ovarian cancer. That was her six months later. Changed her diet, gave birth to herself, died of her original disease, a healed woman. All right, that's the difference. We talked about that last night. What do you recommend for someone who's suffering from backlash, has been bamboozled by the beauty myth, and is currently out God knows where running with wolves? <laughs> that's us. That's all of us right now, okay. Let's just end. I want to live to be an outrageous old woman who's never accused of being an old lady. I want to live to have 10,000 lovers in one love, one 70 year long loving love. There are at least two of me. I want to get leaner and meaner, sharp edged color of the ground till I discorporate from sheer joy. <laughs> All right.
I think that's the end, yeah, thanks.